Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 19. You might not write well every day, but you can always edit a bad page. You can't edit a blank page. Jody Piccolot. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And the show is also sponsored by Masterclass. Now, I know a lot of you have probably heard of Masterclass, where they have amazing classes on screenwriting from Aaron Sorkin, Shonda Rhimes, Steve Martin on comedy, Judd Apatow on how to write comedy, Uh, But now they're offering a free seven-day trial. So you guys can take these courses for free. It's amazing. And if you are a screenwriter, definitely go sign up and take the classes for free. you got seven days to watch as many classes as you want. So just head over to IndieFilmMuscle.com forward slash free masterclass and take advantage while it lasts. So today on the show, guys, we've got screenwriter Scott Meyer who – He's been writing in Hollywood as a professional screenwriter for the better part of 30 years now. And uh, he wrote one of my favorite movies uh, growing up called K-9 with James Belushi back in 89. But he's written many other things and worked on multiple projects over the years. But even more impressive to me is that he runs GoIntoTheStory.com, which is an insane treasure trove of screenwriting information, resources, And the man is crazier than I am because you guys know I put out a a lot of content on Indie Film Hustle. This man has been putting out daily posts for I think now like 10 years or something like that. It's insane. He literally puts out new posts, new resources, new articles every single day. He is a maniac and a machine and I love him for it. Uh, And also, he is the official screenwriting blog for The Blacklist. And if you guys don't know what The Blacklist is, you will after this interview is over. And it's it's pretty amazing what The Blacklist has done for screenwriters and for Hollywood in general. But I wanted to get Scott on because he is uh, an educator. He loves teaching and loves uh, sharing his craft and his knowledge about what it really is like in the film business. And uh, I just wanted to get some real raw knowledge bombs thrown on you guys about screenwriting. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Scott Myers. I'd like to welcome to the show Scott Myers, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. Great to be here, Alex. I appreciate it, man. So how did you get into this crazy business we call the film industry? Uh, you know, circuitous route. Uh, <laughs> I was... I was going to be an academic. I went to UVA undergraduate and Yale graduate school and got a master's of divinity degree at Yale. I was going to become a, a, a you know, PhD and mm-hmm. teach, but my parents at the age of 14 ill-advisedly bought me a guitar <laughs> and I started playing music. And by the time I got done with Yale, I talked to my friends and the dean and I said, you know, if I don't pursue this creative thing and just become an academic, I think I'm going to really regret it. So they said, take a year off, and that became the rest of my life. I played music for seven years. I did stand-up comedy for two years. Along the way, I discovered screenwriting. I wrote a script called Canine. That sold as a spec script in 1987 to Universal, and that's where it all started. Wow, and and you've never looked back since. Well, I've had various incarnations. I I was in L.A. for 15 years, wrote 30 projects for every major studio and every broadcast network except for ABC. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, with my family, we decided 
for family reasons to move back east where I was from. And I took a position as a television producer, basically heading up the creative development uh, uh, company, part, uh, part of the company for uh, Trailblazer Studios. Mm-hmm. And then I, then I started teaching uh, as a uh, side thing because uh, people kept saying every time I do presentations, hey, you're really good at this. Started teaching adjunct through University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, mm-hmm. where we were living, and also UCLA Extension, or the Writers Program. Mm-hmm. And then I started my own uh, online company with Tom Benedict, who wrote Cocoon. It was the first screenwriter I met in L.A. I called Screenwriting Masterclass, so I continue to do that. But now I'm in Chicago at the School of Cinematic Arts at DePaul University and full-time faculty here. And so I've transitioned into teaching. I still write, and I'm still, because of my blog and whatnot, actively involved in, in, uh, in things in Hollywood, the entertainment business. But, uh, uh, yeah, you know, just, uh, wearing a number of hats along the way and eating a lot of great pizza in Chicago, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, pizza <laughs> and everything else. Uh, it's so good, man. The food there is amazing. Yeah, it really is amazing. <laughs> so, um, one of my favorite films, uh, gro- going, uh, one of my favorite films from the video store days when I worked at a video store was K9. Uh, and, uh, I want you to discuss a little bit about how that script was made and what it did for your career. Well, I had, uh, one of those odd circumstances in life. I'm a big Joseph Campbell fan. Mm-hmm. I discovered him in college and, uh, studied him in, 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 in there at the university of Virginia. And then later on at Yale and, uh, have read a bunch of his stuff over the years. And this idea about follow your bliss, find that which, ex, you know, excites you and enlivens you that you have talent for and pursue that. And I'd always been a movie fan. My dad was in the air force. We moved around all over the place. When you're living in Minot air force base, North Dakota, and there's nothing to do and you can go spend 50 cents at the movie theater and, you know, watch movies all day long. Mm-hmm. That's what I did. So I was a huge movie fan, and as it happened one night, I was doing stand-up comedy in a club in Ventura, California. I'd gotten to know the owner, one of the owners there, and he was going to the USC Peter Stark producing program. And the script that he had that he was going to use for his master's thesis had dropped out. It actually got optioned, and it just happened that day. And We were talking that night. And he said, well, I need a script. And he jokingly said to me, can you write a screenplay? <laughs> and I said, I can do that, it's always, <laughs> which has always been my attitude about creative things that I connect with. And I didn't know anything. He gave me three scripts, Witness, Back to the Future, and um, uh, Breaking Away. Mm-hmm. And Sid Field's book, Screenplay Foundations of Screenplay. And so I wrote a script. And then I wrote another one. And then we wrote one together called Canine. And that's based on actually a... a uh, a story we heard about a Ventura policeman, a canine policeman who had been had a police dog partner who had been killed in the line of duty. And we met with this guy and he was just like weeping as he was showing us pictures of this. And we thought, well, that's an interesting idea for a movie. And we wrote the script. And as I say, it's sold to, to Universal, actually a pre uh, preemptive buy mm-hmm. uh, for quite a bit of money. Mm-hmm. And that's where it all started. Uh, we didn't have a representation. <laughs> uh, just, wow, it, it, really? You didn't have any reps at the time? You just were yeah. able to – how did Universal my, find you? My partner was working as an assistant at 20th Century Fox and this slipped the script in there and it went in for the weekend read and Scott Rubin was the head of production and evidently I've heard this from several people. You know, At the end of all these scripts he didn't like, he slapped his hand on the table and said, I love this one. And um, it wound its way around town. We, that, that night, I didn't have an agent that day. That night I met uh, Dan Halstead, uh, Stephen and I, my partner. Mm-hmm. And Dan was just a, a, a junior agent at Bauer Benedict, which later became uh, UTA. Mm-hmm. Dan's got his own management company called Management. But he was our first agent along with Tom, uh, 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 Peter Benedict and Marty Bauer. Fair. And so that's how it started. And then we just ran and took a lot of meetings and off we went. Now there was another uh, dog cop movie around that time. Uh, is there is there any connection? <laughs> yeah, Turner and Hooch yeah. at Disney. Um, and I, uh, you know, we were flavors of the week. We went around and met everybody, including the uh, some an executive at Disney who said, "Hey, we were thinking about suing you guys," and we had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> uh, but there was this project, Turner and Hooch, which was sitting in development hell there, and you know. Very typical. I learned a good lesson in, in Hollywood how they operate. This similar but different, which is the the, the business ethos. They're so afraid to make anything mm-hmm. that they look for something that's similar to something that you know was successful. 
Well, we went around and people were telling us, God, you guys were genius, man. Rin Tin Tin was the biggest star in the history of Hollywood, and here you resurrect him. I hadn't thought about that at all, but I just nodded my head and go, yeah, that's right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, they looked at our script. Disney looked at our script that sold for a lot of money, and they said, well, hey, if Universal thinks that a cop and a dog movie, a comedy, is a good idea, we should resurrect this thing, Turner and Hooch, which they did. And so there was this little – uh, competition between the two films, which would come out first, and ours did, and uh, both movies, you know, did well. Uh, K Nine spawned two sequels, and uh, mm-hmm. Turner and Hooch did very good business as well. Yes, it, they were both. I I used to recommend both of them at the video store. At the if I if one rented one, I'm like, you got to watch K Nine as well, or the vice so versa. So then I probably made I don't know twenty five cents in residuals. So thanks, Alex. I Not any time, sir. Any time. I'm, I'm sure. Well, I, I've watched that movie a ton of times when I was. I love that movie. I love James Belushi. He was in his the top of his power back then uh, during that time of uh, of his career. So uh, thank you for making the movie, sir. <laughs> yeah, it got made, and uh, you can't say that about a lot of projects in Hollywood. I, I mean, seriously. And I remember that hit the theater. It was a theatrical release, and it made – if I remember, it was it did very well. Both of them did very well uh, for the time. That's when Hollywood was making you know, $8 million movies, $10 million movies. You know. Yeah, they don't do that. They don't do that much anymore. That whole – the middle – area is dropped out they do those big big budget franchise things and the lower budget things but uh, it's up to the uh, the financiers and other production companies make those you know 10 million and up movies exactly exactly now how do you how much research do you do uh, when you when you're writing a script well for example with canine i actually spent time with the ventura canine police mm-hmm. then once the project got set up went on some ride-alongs with some of the lapd mm-hmm. um I you know, did a lot of research. So, so yeah, I do a lot of research. Um, you Should, know, do you suggest that screenwriters, when they're writing something, to do as much research as humanly possible? Yes, up to a point. It can, it can become an excuse <laughs> not to write. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, was, when I was living in L.A., of course, you see screenwriters all the time and, and uh, aspiring screenwriters as well. And you say, hey, how you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm working on this great project. It's a World War II thing, you know, set in Korea. Oh, great. See him six months later. How you doing? Yeah, I'm researching this project in World War II in Korea. Well, when are you going to start writing? I do think it's important to do research, you know, be smart about it. But you can get a lot of anecdotes, a lot of character development, uh, a lot of inspirational uh, things that can inspire scenes and whatnot. You, you need to hit that mark. The big 25 cent word, the script has to have a sense of verisimilitude. It's got to feel real. It's not a documentary, mm-hmm. but it's got to come across as authentic. You have to gain the confidence of the reader that you know what you're talking about. So to the degree that you uh, you know, have to do the research to get to that point, then yeah, it's, research is important. But yeah, and I, if, if you walk into any Starbucks here in LA, uh, every, you cannot, wa- cannot see a laptop without Final Draft on it. <laughs> I I can't. I, when I left LA, I flew back there for a TV production thing that we were doing, mm-hmm. and I came in really late at night. And I, I was walking up the courtyard to my hotel room, and I saw this you know the, the light of a computer shining on some guy's face <laughs> in the, alone out there in the courtyard. And I said, I, I guarantee this guy's got final draft open. I just know it. Mm-hmm. And, and I walked past, and sure enough, <laughs> you know, it's like you can't escape it. You know, it's like everywhere. When I got here, when I got here, about almost ten years ago, I was I was shocked that at, at, there's not one coffee bean, not one Starbucks anywhere in Los Angeles at any time. There is someone writing a script, and you know that can be both Good. debilitating yes. and emotionally because you realize, oh my gosh, everybody's like out there trying to do this or doing it. Mm-hmm. But it can also be inspiring in a in a wicked sort of way, in that you realize that when you're not writing, someone else is. Mm-hmm. And so that that can put that sort of negative reinforcement to get your butt in the chair to actually write. Yeah, it's it, writing is a, a screenwriting is an extremely competitive sport, especially here in Hollywood. Yes, it's extremely competitive. Yeah. Now, can you talk a little bit about the blacklist? Yes, the blacklist is to me, and I think this would probably uh, not be uh, countered by many people it's the most significant brand screenwriting brand in hollywood Uh, and i don't say this because i'm my blog going to the story is the official screenwriting blog of the blacklist Mm -hmm. uh though i i love those people and franklin leonard is a friend Mm -hmm. and i've followed what they've done for years but 
you know, Franklin started this like 12 years ago when he was an exec at Universal and just sent around notes to people, you know, emails to friends uh, and going away for, you know, the December break, that, you know, that everybody does for about a month saying, hey, can you recommend some of the best scripts that are out there right now that are not being produced? Mm-hmm. And he simply got their feedback, totaled up the numbers, created a PDF and sent it out. And it became like this thing. It's evolved now to the point where in December, it's basically, I think, the second Monday in December, they come out with the annual blacklist. That's a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, for, for that two to three hour period of time, the entire development community in Hollywood is focused on what makes the blacklist. That I've interviewed dozens of blacklist screenwriters. Mm-hmm. If their script makes the blacklist, uh, it, if you're not represented, you can get represented. Most of the scripts are, you know, with writers who are represented. Mm-hmm. If if the project has been sitting and not moving forward, well, oftentimes it gets it moved forward. There, there's talent now that will only read material uh, if it's on the blacklist. For example, uh, um, uh, the Imitation Game. Mm-hmm. Benedict Cumberbatch read that script because it was a top blacklist script. I've read several actors who, who, who talk about how that essentially it's an imprimatur. Uh, the blacklist is a good housekeeping seal of approval that the community, the development community is saying, this is a script you know, worthy of your attention. Uh, so the blacklist uh, is a, is an important, important brand for screenwriters in Hollywood. And I, I, I can tell you that the, every writer that I've interviewed who's made the blacklist, it's been a big boost to their career uh, as well as getting helping to get movies made, and a lot of the a lot of the scripts that are on the blacklist. Sometimes are from what I've known and from what I've I've read over the years. It's like some scripts are just they're not producible. Sometimes <laughs> they're so good or they're so out there that they're wonderful scripts, but Hollywood would just not take the chance on them. Does that happen often too? Uh, that I don't know. Often, I mean, it's you know, just getting anything made is is <laughs> yeah. extremely hard in Hollywood, even if it comes with the you know, the, the kudos from the blacklist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There have been certain projects, like there was a project about, uh, a comedy about Ronald Reagan being president who, uh, was, you know, suffering from essentially early, you know, or uh, dementia. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that was, looked like that was going to go forward, but then, you know, some people thought that was insensitive or whatnot. So that, that got pulled. Um, ironically, you know, some of the more bizarre scripts, uh, the, I think the blacklist helps. For example, there was the script uh, uh, that uh, oh gosh, the one about Michael Jackson's monkey. Yes, uh, I heard about that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, Isaac Adamson I think wrote that up in yeah. Portland, and it it you know it's now it's getting made as a stop action, stop motion picture, stop mm-hmm. action, motion picture, whatever you call that that technology mm-hmm. with Dan Harmon as an executive producer. So. Uh, Bubbles was the name of the script. Of that was course. the name of Michael Jackson's ship. It's course. like literally told from the perspective of Bubbles during a crucial year in Michael Jackson's life. So it's genius. It's actually a quite genius concept. Oh, it's fantastic. And of course, Isaac said there was no way that he thought anything would happen with it. He just thought it was a funny idea. But there you go. It was kind of like what um, Charlie Kaufman does with his scripts, like, you know, being John Malkovich, who in the right mind thought that that would ever get made. Right, yeah. but but it was it was genius. It was absolutely a brilliant script. Um, can you talk a little bit about, from your perspective, your feeling on the way Hollywood is going today, and how it's so dramatically changed from the days of canine uh, to the days of today? And 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 obviously, a lot of big problems are happening at, at the box office this year. It's one of the worst box offices uh, in in decades, if I'm not mistaken. And I know this Labor Day. Coming up, they said that this is going to be the worst Labor Day weekend in 25 years. So I want to hear your perspective on that, if you can. Well, it has changed considerably. So the underlying ethos of similar but different that we talked about earlier, that I think is still pretty much in place. In fact, in some respects, worse. it's <laughs> almost like they – yeah, it's almost worse in that they're, they're looking for things that are more similar than more different because mm-hmm. that fear factor. Uh, the main – changes, uh, you know, some of them for the positive, the digital technologies, Mm -hmm. which, uh, in, in some respects, at least if you're a filmmaker is a major boon because it, you know, you don't need to buy film stock. You know, you can literally go out with a a digital camera or even your iPhone. We saw Mm -hmm. that with Tangerine, Mm -hmm. that movie, 
where you can go out and make a movie for next to nothing. You know, they, these micro budget films, uh, Edward Burns makes and whatnot that, you know, for $25,000 or even mm -hmm. less, mm -hmm. you can do that nowadays. On the other hand, because of digital technology, you've got the CGI phenomenon so that, uh, you know, you can make these incredible spectacle movies. Unfortunately, um, that has tended to suck the air out of what used to be a mainstay of Hollywood filmmaking, which was a mid-budget dramas, mid-budget you know, action thrillers and whatnot. And so the studios, for whatever reason, I think they have some numbers to bear this out, though that may be changing with this summer because so many of the uh, franchise movies have underperformed mm -hmm. at the box office. You know, they put their, their, uh, their money into these franchise films. You know, I have this, you know, the, you've heard that theory of the four quadrant you know, film, which is adult, child, male, female. Well, my theory is that there's a new four quadrant theory, franchise, uh, 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 let's see, franchise, spectacle, uh, nostalgia, and international. Mm -hmm. Those four things are really driving the marketplace right now. And so you've got this bifurcated approach that the studio, the major studios have, which is expensive 150 200 200 million 250 million dollar franchise movies mm -hmm. and then lower budget genre type things in right. the middle whatever is left of the middle is really being handled by these financiers and production companies there's probably still as many movies being made maybe if maybe not as many necessarily as back in the 80s but the major studios are not making anywhere disney used to make like 35 40 films a year yeah exactly now they make you know maybe 15 so and that, that's, and that's a lot. Trip. And that's a lot. And this, I mean, they, they're probably the leader. I don't think, cause a lot of the big studios are like Paramount for God's sake. They make like two, three, four, uh, yeah. you know, big, big movies a year. So it's, it's changed dramatically. Yeah. Well, and it changes with each regime, like Warner brothers for many years. Like I track spec scripts, uh, deals. I've been tracking them since 1991 on my blog. I've got a database of over 2000 spec script deals mm -hmm. since 1991. Um, you're Warner brothers, you're, you're a crazy man. <laughs> uh, well, I just, uh, you know, I started doing it because that's when you're a screenwriter, you got to know what's selling, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and you got to, if only to cover your ass to say, oh, well, that project sold. That was just like what I've got, you know, so I can't be doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. But just to also follow the trends, if you're looking at like what's in the at movie theaters right now mm -hmm. as being an example of what the buyers are buying, you're two to five years behind the trends. Mm -hmm. You know, you follow the spec script deals now in order to find out what the development community is interested in. Um, uh, anyhow, so I don't know where I was going with that. I forgot. I lost my train of thought. But um, how crazy? Yeah, how crazy? Um, the mid the mid range things are, oh, are the, gone. Yeah, the mid range. So so the, yeah, the, these financiers, these so called financiers. You know, many of them sons and daughters of billionaires like Megan Ellison and David Ellison, mm -hmm. uh, and Aparna Productions. You know, they will step in and they'll make some of these movies, you know, that we would typically see in the past. The studios would have been doing, but uh, mm -hmm. the studios aren't. But we'll see. It'll be interesting. Um, I'm not sure whether, you know, maybe there's a bit of franchise fatigue. And the idea that they can just throw spectacle on the screen. By the way, Aristotle, that was the lowest. <laughs> that was the least important thing in his list of things in poetic. Spectacle was at the very bottom. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's like you, know, you have all the stuff on the screen. If, it, if there's no emotional resonance with the characters, you know, what's, what does it mean? Well, that has tended to play out OK. Some of these movies that have done poorly domestically have done OK internationally, which now is basically 70 percent of box office revenues. But, you know, they're getting more savvy about this. They're saying, hey, wait a minute. We want a good story, too. So I'm not so sure that we might see a little bit of a retrenchment where they start to make a, a few more movies and lower budget movies, the major studios. But uh, we'll see. Um, I mean, look know. at look at a movie like Deadpool, which is an anomaly, but that is a big studio movie. But it was made for forty million dollars and did not. It was it was a complete against everything that the studios normally do. It's an R rated movie. It was a second tier, a third tier character. Uh, and Ryan Reynolds is you know he's a star, but he's not like a, he wasn't a monster monster star either. You know that uh, he's not a Tom Cruise or any of these kind of bigger stars. Uh, that would justify a big, big movie like that. So it was really wonderful to see a movie like that not only get made, but to shake up the the, the industry because it outperformed pretty much, I think, almost every a comic book movie that year that came out. Yeah, those writers that you know that took them ten years. Yeah, 
you know, to get the thing. Ryan Reynolds basically, you know, kept not stringing them along, but supporting that project because people were saying, well, who's going to go see an R rated superhero movie that's basically kind of winking at the genre. Right. And then the, the way they finally got it done is, is uh, Ryan Reynolds leaked, <laughs> leaked some footage onto the internet and everyone went crazy. Yeah. Right. Same thing, a similar thing with Arrival. You know, yeah. Eric Heiser, I know, you know, he would go around town when he was having all these meetings and they say, well, what, you know, after the end of the meeting, hey, what, what's your passion project? And he'd whip out the short story by Ted Chang, mm-hmm. story of your life, and say, I'd like to do this. And they'd say, oh, great. Well, what is it? Well, it's about these aliens that, you know, they, they, oh, aliens. Oh, that's great. So, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so the hero, you know, it's like the big action thing. Well, no, not really. The hero is a woman and she's a linguist. She's a, she's a what? <laughs> She's a linguist. And, and so, but there's still a big action, you know, blowing up. And no, actually, the aliens just leave. You know, it's a linguist who solves it. And they would just, you know, nobody was going to make this movie until, you know, some, some producers finally saw it. And now, that, you know, you see it. It's, just, it's a fantastic movie and it's done really well. Mm-hmm. It always takes, there's, it takes one person to say yes, one person who's got cloud and or passion power. for it. Yeah. And you just try to find, as a screenwriter, you try and find those people. Yes. It's, yeah. Because, yeah, on paper, that doesn't look. You know, it doesn't fit in all the boxes that a studio would be looking for. Uh, but, it's in like none of the boxes. <laughs> not even one. <laughs> not even one. Other than science fiction, but, you know, a female lead, a drama. A linguist. <laughs> linguist. Uh, you know. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, it's, it's no one, no action. What? What? It didn't make any sense. I'm, I'm, you know, do you ever think that Hollywood is going to come around to original ideas? And really start focusing on them because they might be riskier, but they, but these franchises that they keep bringing up, they're all from eighties, nineties, and even two thousands. Uh, and that's what they keep recycling. And, and, and they're even going deeper now into television and, and, you know, anything that's, you know, but there's a certain point where they're going to run out. They're going to run out of, I mean, like they're redoing Fantastic Four again. And they're rebooting it again. Like guys, just original <laughs> what do you think uh look if you talk to you know most working screenwriters yeah they all we all say the same thing you know which is we'd love to see more original movies made mm-hmm. but the reality is again it's a fear-based business and right now frankly this nostalgia element is mm-hmm. just huge no stranger things and, and that kind of yeah and, and so i mean like the perfect you know what really it, drove this home to me was when i saw jurassic world mm-hmm. you remember that the spielberg gaze you know when they look up and yeah, yeah. You know, right in jurassic park when you first saw that that was when they saw the dinosaurs for the first time mm-hmm. in jurassic world when you first saw that it's when they saw the park for the first time so the Jurassic World was was a was a, a wash in nostalgia about the movie Jurassic Park as exhibited <laughs> in the the actual park itself. Mm-hmm. So I think we see that right now, and that's a major driver. Frankly, even some many blacklist scripts that do well have a nostalgic element. Uh, last year, uh, the, the the top script was on Madonna, the she, the year that she was. Mm-hmm. You know, a blonde ambition. She, uh, she was going to break out that year. The year before that was Bubbles on Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. Um, yesterday, a spec script sold that was uh, called Jack and Dick about the friendship, the odd friendship between Jack Kennedy and Dick Nixon. Really? You know, so that's – yeah. Uh, so you see a lot of these uh, blacklist scripts, the dramas are historically based dramas that evoke something of our past. And so, I, I, it, you know, you can still do original movies, mm-hmm. you know, involving nostalgia, uh, but uh, th- this franchise type thing, yeah, that's just completely all about uh, repeating the same thing. Look, I have a running bet with some writers. How soon will Warner Brothers reboot Harry Potter? Yeah, I was wondering that myself. Like, at a certain point, like, when are they going to do it again? Uh, you know, if they continue to have problems, you know, that, which they are, mm-hmm. it just shrinks the time. Before you, because you know they're going to do that. But I mean, well, I mean, they did it with the Hobbit, which was just, oh god, like why? You know, they did Lord. That basically the as close to a reboot of Lord of the Rings as they could have made. Uh, but you know, we, I was wondering, like, how long is it going to take? I'm like, can they do it? Like, you know, it's Harry Potter. I mean, this is something that's never been done in the history of cinema. Uh, yeah. We'll see. I, I look. It's a, it's an IP. They own it. It's you know uh, universally loved they'll have another generation that will come up and 
and have their version of Emma Watson and mm -hmm. you know all the rest. Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put Hollywood. You know, they they're driven by obviously trying to make money. You know, mm -hmm. but these things are all run in cycles. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I you know I remember I was a musician for many years and. Uh, living in Aspen, Colorado, and which was great at the time because there were all these clubs where we could play. But then disco came along, and so a lot of these clubs <laughs> turned, you know, turned into disco, and it was very depressing for you know, uh, you know, actual musicians because you wouldn't make as much, you know, money that way. Mm -hmm. But then what came along? You know, punk music came along, mm -hmm. and Garage Band, uh, The Dire Straits came along with mm -hmm. uh, Sultans of Swing, and so that you know led in the whole. Uh, Nirvana and all that stuff. So these things run in cycles, and it's the same thing with movies. Mm -hmm. You know, there will always be uh, filmmakers out there doing original content, and with the digital technologies, you know, it's not that expensive to go out and and do things like the Duplass Brothers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, where you can just make these movies uh, that are character based, and they'll find their you know they'll find their mark. Uh, the Big Sick, perfect example. Mm -hmm. Did you see The Big Sick? No, I have not Great seen it. Movie. I want oh, to it's see terrific. It. It's a terrific movie. It's got like a 98 rating on, on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's an original film, and it's just touching and human and done great business. And so there's always a, you know, a room for that type of thing. Now, where um, agents and managers, how and when do you need to get one? <laughs> how and when? Well, uh, obviously, it's of a benefit to uh, get represented. You can't typically get material to producers and studios without being represented. Uh, some people can have an entertainment lawyer and do it that way. Uh, how do you get a manager, basically, or an agent? First of all, I think my advice to people is you focus on managers. Managers are different breed than agents. Agents are, you know, this is a real generalization, and it varies from agency to agency and management mm -hmm. company to management company. Mm -hmm. But as it was explained to me once by a manager, he said agents wear suits and managers wear blue jeans, <laughs> which is an interesting way to think about it. And agents are deal makers, largely. Mm -hmm. You know, that's their primary thing. Mm -hmm. Managers are more about nurturing the careers of uh, of writers, and so they can spend a lot more time with writers. You know, actually developing material and whatnot. Again, it varies from manager to manager. They're much more likely to be uh, open to unsolicited material. Mm -hmm. Just email them. Do it very briefly. Uh, like Seth Blockhead, did. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he wrote uh, he wrote uh, Hannah, and uh, Man, he's what a great uh, script. Oh. He, he was in Vancouver, and he's just sent out an email to like 500 managers. Uh, new spec script: girl trained to be an assassin. Interested? And he got like two responses, and one of them became his manager, and then that led to Hannah. Well, you can be a lot more point uh, targeted on that. You know, whatever project you've got, find. Go to IMDb Pro, find ten to fifteen movies that are like yours in the you know same genre space. Mm -hmm. Identify the producers who are also managers. That's one of the reasons why agents become managers because they can also be producers. Mm -hmm. And then find out their email addresses. Oftentimes you can find them online or through Done Deal Pro, Twitter, that's <laughs> Twitter, whatever. Yeah, um, and then to do a very simple thing. Say you know I've got a spec script like your movie, and then that's that's in your subject line and then you go into your text and just very briefly uh here's a log line uh, are you interested but i've known people who've gotten i know a lot of people actually have gotten uh into the door that way more traditional ways you can go use the nickel uh, fellowships in screenwriting which is the most prestigious of those contests mm -hmm. there are other ones but that's the one that i've interviewed every new winner since 2012 and so again like the blacklist that's one of those things that can change your life you can get representation off and get a lot of work uh, the blacklist has its website uh by the way i don't get paid by the blacklist so i'm not you know getting a kickback here mm -hmm. but that but that's been very successful it's like real time hollywood i think there are like over three thousand members of the hollywood development community that track it's probably their their assistants who do this like on monday morning and go through and just see what's up there but you can from anywhere in the world upload a script there obviously you have to pay money to have it hosted they mm -hmm. can you get it evaluated by their readers but they've had i think five movies made off of scripts discovered off the blacklist website at this point five and they've had hundreds of people get representation that way so so there are you know as 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 um difficult as it is mm -hmm. and challenging as it is and in some ways it's more competitive than ever 
it's actually got more access to Hollywood, I think, nowadays than it used to be. It used to be you had to know someone who was sisters with someone, who slept with someone, who worked in the business to get your material to someone who could actually read it and, and do something about it. Nowadays, there are these conduits into the system mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, that, you, that, that don't require you to move to L.A. and become an assistant, though that's a, certainly a, you know, an intelligent thing to do if you're young and, mm-hmm. and have the wherewithal to do that. Um, but in terms of getting a manager, that's one way of doing it, you know, is literally you do your research, find some movies that were like your script and then source those, uh, those manager producers and just email them. And the best of all worlds, you'd have three scripts in the same genre, uh, Mm -hmm. and say, because that shows that you're, you've got an approach, you've got passion, you're persistent, you've got three projects, which they could potentially set up. Or try and get you know writing assignments you know, for, for writing assignments, or even get them uh, uh, optioned or sold. Uh, but but generally speaking, that's that's one way to do it. Now, can you talk a little bit about what writing assignments are? Open writing assignments. OWAs. Uh, that used to be a staple of the business. I mean, I did of the thirty projects that I have done in Hollywood. Uh, you know, when I was. When I was out there actually vying for open writing assignments. I don't do them now. I just write on spec, and if they like it, great. If not, then, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that that used to be a staple of the business. I mean, I'd say that probably 20 to 22 of the projects I've written have been open writing assignments. Uh, the rest were pitches or specs that sold. Um, an open writing assignment is what it sounds like. It's a, 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 a project that's at a studio or a production company where – They've either got a draft that was written by like a first writer and they feel that it needs some work or a draft that's been rewritten by a bunch of writers, uh, which is often the case. And, and they need someone to come in and fix it, you know, in a very fundamental way, a screenwriter in Hollywood is a problem solver. Mm -hmm. And so executives and production executives We'll, we'll meet with you and say, look, we, we know the script has problems. We don't know how to fix it. So your job as a screenwriter is to identify the problems and then come in with suggestions. Here's how I would approach this and, and solving this. Here's the story I would tell. And, uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of the story of uh, Forrest Gump, um, how uh, I had done some work with the, the producer who discovered the book, uh, Wendy Feinerman, and she told the story about how – Tom Hanks. This is a t- passion project for Tom Hanks, and they'd had three A-list writers writing adapting that uh, that book, and had not nailed it. And then uh, they finally brought in Eric Roth, and Eric read the scripts and read the book, and, and he said, "I think I know what the problem is. There's no love story. Jenny, I guess, is not that big of a, a deal in the book, mm-hmm. but what Eric identified was a problem. There's no emotional through line for that project. So that's a perfect example of an open writing assignment where we came in and identify a problem. And then, I mean, can you imagine Forrest Gump without the, the Forrest Jenny love story? Well, of course not. <laughs> no. So yeah. it's just amazing that three A-list writers didn't identify that, but Eric did. So open writing assignment, the problem is that there's just fewer projects getting made now. So there's fewer open writing assignments. And that's why you see something interesting nowadays that working screenwriters, mm-hmm. these are people who are like maybe not A-list, but A-minus list or B-list screenwriters – will spec scripts, you know, at least one a year. Mm-hmm. We'll write a spec script, uh, you know, at least one, maybe even two a year, mm-hmm. even while they're, you know, they're actively involved in the business and, and getting work because the open writing assignment arena, you chase those things. I, I know a writer who, who for a year chased open writing assignments, didn't land one thing and just said, screw it. And then he specced something and then, uh, you know, and, and that, and that set up. So, that that didn't used to be the case. You would write a spec script, and that was it. It was just to get you into the business. Nowadays, that you know, the, there are so few writing assignments available that 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 market has shrunk. That you see a lot of working screenwriters who are continuing to write spec scripts. So, now, do you find that a lot of screenwriters that normally did feature work are now going towards television and streaming platforms? Yes, that's absolutely the case. And there's an upside and a downside to that. Mm-hmm. Some upsides are it's it's employment, mm-hmm. uh, so that's one thing. The uh, downside of that is it's not as much money, and particularly the streaming services, the the staffs are smaller, the time pressure, the budgets are less, so you're doing a lot more work 
in some respects for a lot less money than if you were writing a screenplay that you know can vary from project to project but um, but it is employment and it also offers writers an opportunity to do these 10 you know episode chunks eight episodes 12 13 episodes these limited run series they can just go in and knock out a uh, a mini, what we used to call a mini series, mm-hmm. and they're done with it. You know, it's like a long story. Or they can, you know, do like you no know, Holly did with Fargo, and you know, have a three series, a three season series. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, which means that he can go off and do the series, and then go off and direct a movie too in the same year because you know it's only ten episodes or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So uh, that market has blown up. As, you know, they talk about the second golden age of. TV or peak mm-hmm. TV, mm-hmm. you know, supposedly there are over 500 TV series on broadcast, basic cable, pay cable and streaming right now, mm-hmm. 500, mm-hmm. which I think is like quadruple the amount that maybe there were like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting thing is that I, there's a, again, it's just like this, there's so many things changing right now. On the one hand, you've got feature writers going over working in TV and bringing those feature sensibilities to TV. And in many respects, what we call TV now does feel like long movies and does have the Mm -hmm. cinematic quality of movies. On the other hand, we're seeing the flow of ideas from the TV side entering into the film side where you've got these writers rooms, you know, working on transformers at Paramount or working on the horror movies at universal Mm -hmm. or working on DC comics or Marvel. Uh, So there's this really interesting interplay. And frankly, I don't know that in 10 or 15 years, because everybody's, you know, people are actually watching Mad Max Fury Road on their iPhone, which, of course, I would think is insane. It is. But, you know, young people, you know, whatever. In 10 or 15 years, we may not call them movies. We may not call them TV. I mean, I, I ask my students at the beginning of every quarter, I say, so what are you watching? And they tell me what shows they're watching. I say, how many of you watch them on TV? And no one raises their hand. So why even call it TV if we're not even watching it on TV? Yeah. So why well, call it uh, film if you're not shooting on film, <laughs> not shooting on film, you know, if you, you know, what is it about, you know, the two hours, maybe the, we'll, you know, we're seeing a growth by the way of short films, mm-hmm. you know, these short film festivals are expanding and short films is, a, is another way that you can break into Hollywood, you know, go out and make a, a five to 10 minute film, mm-hmm. uh, show your chops as a writer and as a filmmaker. So uh, there's a lot of things in flux. It's a great time to be a content creator. That's one thing. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's a lot more opportunity, but there's you got to put the work in, and that's something I always preach about to everybody in the business that they got to work. And this is not going to be a one year thing. It's a the ten year plan, and you got to get ready for the long haul. Would you agree? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I, that's what I tell my university students here at DePaul. Uh, you know, who have interest in going out to Hollywood. We have a very very successful program here, and and in uh, the LA quarter where they go out, and typically their spring. Uh, quarter, you know, the last year as an undergraduate, uh, you know, 90% of the people that come from our program are actually working in the business. This is after several years out there. Now, granted, some some of them are in lower level, you know, assistant type positions or PA type things, but you know, many of them are now working as writers and, uh, you know, segued into production executive positions and whatnot. Um, but you, yeah, that's why I tell them, you've got to be able to put, think, seven to 10 years, you know, and really, and part of that is not just about finding work, it's about growing up as a human being. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you want to be a storyteller, you've got to have stories to tell. And so, mm-hmm. you know, living life is a big part of it. Absolutely. God, that's, that's like, gold to my ears it's it's uh, so good to hear somebody else saying stuff like this because i preach it all the time and you're right you can't be a writer you can't be a filmmaker unless you live if not your stuff becomes hacky and it just it's regurgitated stuff from what you've seen already as opposed to trying to tell original stories of of your experience on the planet yeah well Uh, that's one thing that we pride ourselves here at depaul because we have a very diverse community of students and faculty and administration we we encourage our students to tell stories that come from their perspective backgrounds. The world right now, perhaps never more than ever, needs stories about diverse diverse people. Amen. Different different cultures, different subcultures, to put a human face on the other, so that we move past this sort of demonization uh, uh, and fear base about who the other is, but to just see that recognize our shared humanity. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's something we're we're very uh, very much in, in favor of and, and encourage here at DePaul. 
Now, can you t- discuss a little bit about what the anatomy of a screenwriting deal in Hollywood looks like? Well, it's changing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like That's everything, everything else. else. <laughs> uh, it used to be you would, you know, you'd get a deal uh, like I did with K9, where you they 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 acquire it, they have an acquisition price, then they give you a fee for you know first draft, and then you'd get a built-in second draft, a rewrite that was built into the contract. After the last Writers Guild strike, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. I think the studios have probably had this in mind before, but they use that to then do these single uh, term deals. Mm-hmm. No, no guaranteed rewrite, which is a real problem because what happens is this. If you're only going to get one shot at a project, right, to go forward with it, you hear you get a, you, you know, you get a call. Well, you know, they like the draft, but if you could just make a couple of changes on it, you know, then, then they well, they bump it up, you know, to the to the food chain, you know. So mm-hmm. okay, so you go away, and now you're doing an unpaid, you know, rewrite. Mm-hmm. You hand it back in. Hey, you know, got just this one thing. If you can do this one thing, so now you, and, and your agents, and you know, are going to say the same, pretty much the same thing to you. Well, it's your choice, but if you want to go in with your best foot forward, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod. So that's been a problem. Um, mm. but the deal is the deal is structured. Look, you can, you know, you can make, you know, you can make a, a goodly amount of money, uh, from project to project. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of these deals that you see trumpeted as a, as a sale are actually options, mm-hmm. which can be for as little as 10,000 or $5,000 or even less. Mm-hmm. So that's not a lot of money. You know, I'd say maybe the typical deal, it's hard to say, you know, you get maybe, uh, 75,000 against, uh, 175,000. What that means is you're going to get $75,000 compensation for the, the script and your writing services versus if it's 175,000, another hundred thousand dollars should the movie get made. That's reducible by if you, you you share credit, writing credit with someone else. But like, you know, in the old days, like canine sold for $750,000, mm-hmm. you know, and there are scripts that do sell for that much money. Uh, but it's just very rare. But so when you see somebody say, oh, it's a six figure deal, you have to be very careful about that because that six figures is almost assuredly talking about the back end stuff. It's like that, you know, that uh, $80,000 against 200,000. So they're saying it's a six figure deal. They're saying that 200,000, but you're not guaranteed that money. You're only guaranteed the $80,000. You also get uh, net profit participation, which translates into zero dollars. There's like hardly any movie that ever gets to net because the studios have various sets of <laughs> accounting books, you know, yeah. and then Forrest, uh, yeah, Forrest Gump still hasn't made any money. Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah. yeah so, um, <laughs> well, you know, when they have gross profit, you know, like Tom Hanks gets dollar one, you know, gross. Well, can you talk a little bit about the difference between net and gross for, for the audience? Okay. Well, gross is, and there's a bunch of different definitions of gross, and this is a little bit beyond my purview. I just know this, is, you know, from as a screenwriter, I'm not a, you know, accountant or anything. Mm-hmm. There's these def- various definitions of gross, you know, dollar one, which is, I think, you know, the one where basically every penny from the, you know, that's being spent, that whoever that talent is, they're going to get a percentage of that from dollar one. Then there's reduced gross and various definitions of gross. But basically, that's what you want. You want to get a gross profit uh, participation deal if you can get it. There are writers who get that, I would imagine, like probably Sorkin gets it and some of the other A-list writers who are very, very well established. Uh, but that's more along the lines of directors and you know top talent, top acting talent. Net is where they say, okay, if we get the net profit, then you're going to get you know your percentage, two and a half or five percent or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but you never reach net because the studios will assign all sorts of costs to the production. See, they'll create a production company for the production. Mm-hmm. Then they lend the money to the production to produce the thing. And they charge interest on that loan. That interest goes back to the studio, and it's also a, it's also a, a cost to the production. Mm. See what I'm saying? So it's like really, really hard to get to net. Um, I think perhaps my big fat Greek wedding, a movie like that, which costs five million dollars and mm-hmm. you know grossed upward to three hundred million, mm-hmm. uh, Nia Vardalos probably you know saw some net dollars on that, but mm-hmm. very very rare. Yeah. So. It, can you can you list off a few of the do's and the don'ts on the business side of screenwriting? Because I know that's a very mysterious thing, the business of screenwriting for screenwriters. Everyone's always talking about the craft, uh, but the business side's not talked about that much. Well, on my blog, you know, I've got 
like 200 blog posts called the business of screenwriting. So yes. you could go, go into the story.com and, and, and read that. I've got a whole slew of things there. Mm-hmm. Um, well, first thing is learn the craft and, 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 you know, that, that's super important. You've got to, <laughs> yes. my, my mantra, right? Watch movies, read scripts, write pages. You know, it's possible to, to learn what you need to do just by doing that. And reading scripts is the one area that people tend to fall down on. It's incredibly important to read scripts, not just the classic scripts, but current scripts, scripts in the last five years that are done, you know, movie scripts and or blacklist scripts or nickel scripts, because you're, you're learning the style sensibilities and, uh, and just getting into the mindset of what people are responding to in Hollywood. But you need to learn your craft. You need to find your voice. You need to have an approach to story prep and how you get through so that you're confident enough to know that when you sign that contract, you know, for $200,000 to write this project, you're going, yay, and you turn the page and it says, script due in 10 weeks, and, you know, your sphincter doesn't go up through your mouth, <laughs> you know, you've got to have the confidence to be able to do that. And so learning the craft is critical. But there's some basic don'ts, you know, don't be an asshole. You know, that's, people a, in, that's a big one. <laughs> people in Hollywood like to work with the people they like to work with. You know, I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but it's absolutely true. If it comes down to writer A or writer B, and writer B is an asshole, and writer A is a not, and they're both equal talents, you know, then they'll probably go with writer A. Um, you know, everybody you meet is a potential uh, n- networking opportunity. And I, you know, I, I don't like the word networking so much, but I mean, it really is true. You, you've got to develop a network. Don't expect your agents and managers to land you you know, gigs, a lot of times you'll land them just through the relationships you develop with production executives. Uh, so, you know, nurture those, you know, follow up with an email or a call and say, Hey, I really enjoyed meeting you. I thought that was great. And drop in, you know, every so often, like two, three months and say, Hey, what's going on? You know, nurture those relationships, be kind to assistants. <laughs> Huge. They, are human, they are human beings just like you. You know, don't overlook them when you're excited to go see that manager, that agent, that studio executive. The assistants are human beings. Moreover, they go up the food chain, and the person who is an assistant today will be a studio executive and could hire you tomorrow. But, you know, just as a human being, you know, be kind to them because they have very, very difficult jobs, and, uh, uh, you know, they, they are worthy of respect. Um, do, do some research, you know, track down – who is who in the studio at the executive level with production companies know a certain amount about the business. You don't have to let it dictate what you write, but to know and track via the trades, you know, variety, Hollywood reporter, deadline, the rap, uh, and, and stay in conversation with other writers about what's going on. Uh, that's, that can be helpful. Uh, you have to determine what kind of writer you are. There are some writers who are very successful at chasing the market. You know, I mean, there's a lot of writers who, who say don't do that, but there are some writers who are like they're action writers or they're thriller writers or they're science fiction writers, and they they know what's out there, they know what's being developed, uh, they try and forecast what will be the next thing that will sell. Uh, you know, so they're very very specifically trying to write to a genre space. There are other writers who are exactly the opposite; they just follow their creative instincts. And, and, you know, some writers can do both, but you need to think about what writer you, you want to be. Here's another a tip, mm-hmm. which is uh, find a genre space that you love and are good at. Mm-hmm. Not to say you can't write across genres, but if you write three scripts in one genre and have two treatments in that same genre and you do what I told you to do earlier about reaching out to a manager. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know a manager alive who would look at your material given that, uh, particularly if you have a good log line for that first you know, project you sent to them. Because if you're in a genre, like this is your thing, I'm an action writer, I'm a thriller writer, you know, mm-hmm. I'm a comedy writer, then that's how they put you up for, for writing assignments. That's how they market you. They brand you, frankly. Mm-hmm. And so they you have, need to be willing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, they have to put you in a box. They have to. They, it's it's yeah. easy. It's an easier sell as opposed to someone who's like he's a comedy writer, but he also does drama. But he does hits his one action script and he does sci-fi. But you're right. If you can f- be a specialist, that's what they're looking for. That you get put on lists. Mm-hmm. You know, I got put on lists. I got put on animal lists <laughs> along with comedy. I wrote a movie after I wrote the dog movie. 
Yeah. I wrote a movie uh, about uh, called uh, 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 was well, it was about it was about a pig and a witness relocation program. <laughs> Genius. Ha- Hamlet. <laughs> and, then, and then there was another one about frogs. There was another one about frogs. So I, I joke that I did, I did movie. I wrote movies about dogs, frogs, and hogs. I mean, you know, they put you in. You, they they <laughs> they assign these things to you, and if you're willing to do that. Right. Then that's your brand, and so you can do that for like seven years and make some good money. You know, right. oh, that 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 person is you know is is a comedy guy, or that that woman is great with, uh, you know, with drama or whatnot. Now you can always write a spec and, and bust out of that, and it's right. not to say you can't write across genres. I know, like Brian Duffield uh, is very very successful, and he writes just all sorts of different things. Sure, but generally speaking, when I talk to managers, they they prefer to have clients who settle on one genre. So those are some words of advice. I hope. Uh, I hope you find that helpful. Now, wh- why hasn't Hamlet been made? <laughs> oh, that was easy. <laughs> we were set. That was uh, Don Steele, and uh, we had a director attached, and uh, uh, we were going. We were in pre-production. Uh-huh. And then um, Babe came out uh. and just completely blew up. Right. It was like nobody anticipated that that movie. And – then the studio just got cold feet. You know, the, you think well, similar but different. But I guess uh, in that case, you know, it was too different. It was too similar or too different. Yeah, too similar. Because <laughs> that sounds genius. I would have loved to watch that. That and K nine as a double feature, I think, would be good. A pig and witness real. I mean, that's so classic late eighties, <laughs> early nineties, right? Very much so. Yeah, I don't. Th- I don't know sure if that's that story flies today, but back then, oh my god, it would have been brilliant. Um, now. What should screenwriters deal? How should screenwriters deal with getting rewritten, which happens almost all the time, and it's a big all, deal. Almost all, yeah. I have a business of screenwriting uh, post that I did where uh, we went up for a, my writing partner and I went for a writing assignment to rewrite a script that had been written by um, uh, uh, Ron Bass. Oh, jeez. Okay. Uh, Ron Bass you know, Ron is Bam, one, one of the most successful screenwriters in the history of Hollywood. Yes, right? yes. Uh, and so um, yeah, I turned to my partner and I said, well, look, if we're up to rewrite him, you know. Uh, yeah, everybody gets rewritten. Everybody gets rewritten. You know, there was that story of Moneyball where Steve Zalian had written a draft of it. And, you know, the, the, that, that story is amazing how that movie got made, uh, you know, considering the – Soderbergh's turning in a draft and mm-hmm. and it, it was different than what the studio expected mm-hmm. and uh, Brad Pitt said no there's a movie here and I see it and since Zalian wrote a draft as I remember the story he was in Rome with his family on vacation his cell phone chirps and he answers and says uh, Steve this is Aaron Sorkin I just wanted to call you let you know that I'm rewriting you on on Moneyball well they ended up actually working parallel mm-hmm. but together on that project basically rewriting each other Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Moneyball came out and it was a successful movie. Everybody gets rewritten. Well, how to deal with it? Well, it hurts. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it, you don't want to get rewritten. All right. uh, if you're the person being rewritten, um, you don't mind a little off color story, do you? Mm-hmm. For, for the, oh, uh, uh, off color is fine. Okay. So, because uh, we got rewritten on, on K9, mm-hmm. and uh, when they when they said they were going to bring somebody else in, of course, they tell you this is how much confidence we have in the project. We're actually bringing in someone to rewrite you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that's, a mean, ho- that's, that's logic, so right? ho- that's so Hollywood. I can't even I mean, tell you how Hollywood. It's actually a compliment to your talent that we're bringing in somebody to rewrite you. You know, so anyhow, uh, my agent uh, Marty Bauer said, "Well, guys, you got effed, but you got effed with a golden dick." So you know, I mean that's. <laughs> You know, um, that's kind of uh, the, the mindset. You, you just, you know, you, you that's why you have multiple projects going. Mm-hmm. You stack projects. That's what you can do as a writer. So you're writing this, you're rewriting another thing, you're developing another thing. So you give yourself 24 hours, go tie one on, you know, get, get the hammered, go talk to your friends, then wake up the next day and start on the next project. You do, know? You, do you know the story of uh, the Pretty Women rewrite? Well, it was a very dark drama. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, yeah. I was, I was assuming you would that the six thousand. It was called Six Grand or something like that, and and the writer was super upset about him being rewritten. This is not my story. Yeah. And then, of course, after it made you know a gazillion dollars, he's like, "Yeah, that was mine. I did that." <laughs> and he ended up with sole credit. So yeah. Uh, on the other side, if you are rewriting someone, mm-hmm. um, it's become. I think. I think writers have become more human uh, nowadays uh, about that. Uh, it's it's a good thing to contact the person you're rewriting. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, Eric Heiser, I talked to him about this, and, and he's, his, his way of approaching it is, look, uh, they've handed me the keys to your car, and so I'm going to drive it for a while, but it's still your car, and I just wanted you to know. And then you, you haven't give them an opportunity to talk about you know, what their vision for it was and, and just be a decent human being. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that does take a certain amount of, uh, uh humanity, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, to, courage, and, too. And courage. courage to call up a writer and say, you know, look, I'm rewriting you and I just want, you know, to reach out to you. But I think that's a decent thing to do. Mm-hmm. And if writers should be decent to each other, you know, if, if other people aren't going to be decent to us, at least writers can be. <laughs> right. Cause writers are historically one of the most beaten down <laughs> professions in the business. Uh, Yeah. Ironically enough, and I think part of it is, frankly, uh, you know, be, beyond everything else, and they can get away with it, and that writers tend to be, you know, kind of a can be cantankerous characters and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Part of it is, frankly, they they can't do what we do, right? And that that bothers them. Mm-hmm. They they can't create something out of nothing. They can't problem solve like we can. And mm-hmm. so there's, there's, that's some of the psychological subtext going on there historically. I've never heard it, I've never heard it put that way before. That makes perfect sense, actually. It makes yeah, it's, it's like, it goes back to that old that line. I think Thalberg, you know, Irving Thalberg, the first great Hollywood producer, was meeting with the writers. And he had, you know, a love-hate relationship with the writers. Mm-hmm. But he said, you know, what is it with you writers? You know, you think you're so special. It's just, you know. It's just a matter of putting down words. <laughs> and, and one of the writers looked at him and said, yeah, but to know which words. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> now, another question uh, that I get asked a lot by screenwriters, what's, what should be a page count be of a standard Hollywood script? Well, you know, I, I'm not a big one for it. These, these the so-called screenwriting rules. In fact, on my blog, you can mm-hmm. see. Uh, I actually have eight free eBooks now that mm-hmm. uh, blog stuff. I'm, I'm going to end up with 12 this year. Nice. Thanks to uh, Clay Mitchell and Trish Curtin for helping me edit those things. But, uh, one of them is so-called screenwriting rules. Mm-hmm. And one of them is about, you know, all page count. Um, you know, stories are organic and yeah, there are conventions and expectations, but there's no real rules. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you can, can you have an act that goes into like page 35? Yeah. You know, it, you've got to make sure that it, it needs 35 pages, but, Generally speaking, you're looking at 20, 25. Hours. Okay, page count. I think that uh, there's been some shrinkage, frankly, mm-hmm. you know, because people like things to move more, more quickly nowadays because of YouTube and whatever. So what used to be like 120 page script, I'd say now maybe you know we tend to see scripts 100, 510 pages. Mm-hmm. What used to be the end of Act One is now oftentimes the middle of Act One. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, I would say, you know, again, if you this is just a rule of thumb, and well, I hate to use that word, no, it just says a ballpark uh, touchstone. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to write a hundred page script. Basically, uh, there are certain readers that will think that a script maybe is under baked, undercooked if it comes in at ninety pages or not. Uh, you know, something around like that. Now that's not always the case because you may work with a production company that's very specifically working on a low budget movie, mm-hmm. in which case, you know, 85 pages or 90 pages for a horror film or whatever, or comedy, Perfect. that could be fine. But if it's a studio thing, you know, uh, if it's science fiction, you got to do a lot of world building. So maybe it's a little longer. If it's an action movie with a lot of scene description and not much dialogue, maybe it's a little shorter. So, uh, I, you know, if, if 100 pages is probably a good, you know, page count, you mm-hmm. know, I like 105, but you know, everybody's got their thing. You know? Got it. And then are screenwriting contests worth it? Well, to the people whose careers have been benefited, <laughs> by them, I, they would probably say yes. I mean, there's a bunch of them out there. There's the Austin film festival. There's tracking B, there's tracking board. There's nickel. You know, well, the nickel is, is legit. I mean, that's the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. I mean, mm-hmm. that's been around for you – know, I mean, that's like got major people involved uh, you know, uh, on, that, on that board. And, and uh, you know, there's just a track record of those people who you know, win the nickel mm-hmm. going on and, and doing well. Well, even placing in the nickel, it gets you attention. Uh, yeah. You, you, they, they sent out an email blast, I think, from quarterfinals up, maybe semifinals up. I, can't, mm-hmm. I don't know exactly. The top ten, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I know people who finished in the top ten. Uh, in fact, we had a DePaul student who finished in the top ten and uh, uh, you know, got representation off that. He's currently working as a screenwriter in Hollywood. So, 
Um, yeah, you know, I, you have to understand bottom line, mm-hmm. these contests are about them making money. Mm. You have to understand that, you know, they don't do this because they're, they're, you know, uh, generous. <laughs> <laughs> they do this is a money making operation. Mm-hmm. That's why they charge those fees. Mm-hmm. Okay. So just understand that, um, you know, do your due diligence. Uh, if you make sure you see, uh, you know, some check the results, you know, have people actually translate into getting gigs. Now you have to be careful. There's some really kind of hinky things up there. Mm-hmm. You know, people will say, you know, this deal, you know, so-and-so who was a graduate of this, you know, online educational outfit or who is, who is, a, they'll say an alumnus, alumnus of, you know, well, what that means is they, they submitted their script to the competition, mm-hmm. right? You know, they didn't actually learn anything or this educational outfit. Maybe they just gave them a bunch of PDFs mm-hmm. and they did peer review of their kind of, but they'll say this deal that they signed. Well, what the deal is, is simply, they just got representation. They get their manager. No, there was no money. There's no deal. Right. Right. You don't even sign with a manager. You know, there's no contracts with managers. So you have to be very careful about what they, they, they claim, uh, you know, their success rate is. But, you know, if you do due diligence, you'll find, read interviews with writers. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of them will talk about their experiences, you know, having tried contests. And, uh, but if you really want to be safe, the nickel is the safest one. I think mm-hmm. probably the Austin Film Festival mm-hmm. is you know, maybe not as much cachet as the nickel. Well, mm-hmm. I definitely doesn't have as much cachet. But um, then the other ones, you know, uh, just be buyer aware. They are out to make money, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, and some of them, I guess, are you know more successful than others. But uh, just you know, the, the best thing you can do is just write the best script possible. And uh, if you really want an honest, like, you know, unfiltered thing is, is to use the Blacklist website because then that, that's the ultimate contest. You're actually having people who are in the business – you know, reading your material based on, uh, you know, your log line and, and some evaluations and, uh, as a direct line to, to the buyer. Great, great advice. Now, I wanted you to I wanted to go into your insane blog, Go Into the Story. It, I want you to talk a little bit about that blog and, and what an insane re- resource it is for screenwriters. Well, I started it on May 16, 2008, and I've blogged every day since. So it's like 3,300 consecutive days. Jesus. The, the inspiration for it was simply this. You know, back then, um, there weren't as many resources as there are now. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the stuff that was being trumpeted as, you know, back then you'd see actually people saying, you know, learn the secrets to writing a million-dollar spec script, you know. From people who had never worked in Hollywood or <laughs> right. had a movie made. Shysters. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that was upsetting. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I had people in my online classes saying, I just got feel completely ripped off. And, or they'd show me notes that they got from a script consultant and mm-hmm. the notes were just complete, you know, BS. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I felt like, well, I, I worked in the business. I, you know, I've had movies made. I've written dozens of projects. I've done TV and film. I've taught. You know, um, John August had a great, you know, has had, he's like the grandfather of all this stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. he started his blog, I believe in 2004 Mm -hmm. and it's an incredible resource. But what I didn't see was someone doing it every day, you know, like someone who was following the news, Mm -hmm. someone who's tracking spec script deals, someone who's providing inspiration and information on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And it's just, was an extension of what I do naturally as a writer where I would just go through and look at the trades, follow the news. And I would mm-hmm. read, I read poems and I read writing quotes for inspiration. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so I, that's how I started it. It's like a free resource, no advertisement, I've never had an advertisement on my blog. Mm-hmm. So they don't have to feel like they're being, you know, uploaded or trying to be, I don't forget that phrase, but upsold or anything. Mm-hmm. About anything. Um, and to have this resource and then ultimately to build this, this mass of content so that people could go and just, you know, look through it and find stuff on like every different subject. So there are now 23,000 posts on the blog. <laughs> you know, Jeez. I have there's six posts a day. You can get a daily summary, you know, so it comes in your email. You do six posts a day? Yeah, it's, it's like, again, I'm, I type really fast. I think really fast. I've gotten used to doing that. I'm, I, I'm like the perfect blogger for this type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, like, for example, here's a, here's a great example of something that emerged out of the blog. Um, in November 2015, I'd had a project I was writing, and, and uh, something in the news happened that blew it up. 
Mm -hmm. just completely blew it up. I I could no longer write that project because of what happened in the news. Mm -hmm. And I'd had a comedy that I'd been sitting on for some time, and I got so frustrated, I said, well, NaNoWriMo was no longer doing the script frenzy, which they did up until 2013, which was a script version of NaNoWriMo, where you write a novel in a month. Mm -hmm. This would be writing a script in a month. So I just invited people via my blog to join me in November, I was going to write a, 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 a zero draft. I said, I'm just going to write this thing from fade into fade out. You know, it's going to be, it's going to suck, mm-hmm. but I'm just going to put the words down. And I normally don't do that. I normally work from an outline, but I just wanted to try it. Mm-hmm. Well, I had over a thousand people respond to that. In fact, it created this thing called zero draft 30 challenge, the zero draft 30 challenge, which we now run twice a year. So mm-hmm. starting on September 1st, which is tomorrow, uh, we're going to be running the Zero Draft 30 2017 September Challenge. Mm-hmm. And every day on the blog, I'm going to post something there along with my other posts about the challenge where people come and they talk about you know, the, what they're writing. They'll provide some inspiration of quotes or videos or whatnot. Uh, there's a Facebook group, the Zero Draft 30 Facebook group, which has got 2,300 members, a terrific group of people, very mm-hmm. support, positive-minded. We have a Twitter feed. Hashtag ZD30 script. Uh, and so this is something that's emerged now that twice a year, the idea to get people writing to write two spec scripts a year, you know, which is what you, you, you should be doing. And so uh, that's something that's emerged from the blog. The blog has created all sorts of initiatives and, and community outreach type of things. And uh, it's been very successful. I've had more traffic now than I've ever had site traffic. Yeah. That's uh, that's amazing. Oh, well, I mean, I've 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 known about your site for a long time, and I, I I before I ever opened up any film hustle, I used to visit it all the time, and and you just have such a wealth of information. It, it's it's there's I don't know of another resource out there that has so much for free. For, for free. free, it's for all free. free. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, let me let me just I'll, one little anecdote about this. You know, mm-hmm. I had a friend who's a writer who said, "Scott, why are you doing this? This is insane. Why are you <laughs> giving away all this content for free?" Right. Basically, every almost every not almost every good thing that's happened to me professionally since mm-hmm. has been because of that blog. Yep. I, I, I am now more well connected in Hollywood than I ever was when I lived two miles from 20th Century Fox. I know more managers, more agents, more producers, more talent, more writers than I ever did when I was out there. And I would uh, I would say the exact same thing has happened to me ever since I launched Indie Film Hustle. The the yeah. amount of connections, relationships, being able to sit down and talk to you for an hour, you know, without a blog, that's very difficult to, to reach out to to people of your caliber and uh and, and just as the relationships you've built over the time. It it is everything that's happened to me since I opened up Indie Film Hustle has been directly it's been generally directly because of the of the blog, so I understand one hundred and ten percent. Yeah, your site is you know one of those sites that that provides quality content, and those resources are great. You know, uh, I think film school is not for everybody. I think it, uh, you know at a school like DePaul where they can literally go out and they're making movies in their freshman year because we've got three sound stages awesome. at Cinespace where they shoot all the Chicago Fire, Chicago Med, and all that stuff. Uh, they've got incredible gear, but but film school is not for everybody. So you can put it together, uh, a version of it, mm-hmm. you know, by using places like going to the story or, or your site and other sites. Uh, there's just a ton of free quality content. Just make sure you vet things and and are looking for the quality uh, sites out there. Now I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask you the last few questions, which I ask all of my guests. Uh, so be pre- be prepared for your Oprah questions. I call these the Oprah questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to sell their first screenplay? Um, well, if it's only their first screenplay, they've written their first screenplay, I would say write two more. Mm-hmm. You know, don't try and sell your first screenplay. Um, you, I, I can almost guarantee you that after you've written three screenplays, you'll look at your first screenplay and go, wow, I, I, I thought I'd written a really a great script, but th- it's got some issues. So, so, you know, and, and moreover, again, are you going to be, when you're signing that contract in the lawyer's office <laughs> and it says this script is due in 10 weeks, just, I, I tell this to my university students and you can just see them tense up. Mm-hmm. I say, you got to know, you've got to have a confidence that you can do this. Now, maybe after one script like uh, Diablo Cody, Mm-hmm. you know uh did uh would you know you know but she'd written she'd been a blogger for years and she'd written you know a memoir 
She was a writer. She's a born writer. Mm-hmm. You know, and maybe some people can do it with one script, but my advice would be write two more scripts. The best advice I've ever heard uh, about screenwriting was uh, given to me by Jim Ools. Do you know Jim? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jim said, when you get sit down, write a screenplay. When you're done with that screenplay, write it straight. Don't edit it. Don't do anything. Just just write it straight. When you're done, put it in your dress, in, in, in a drawer. Start another screenplay. Do the exact same process. Put it in the drawer. Do it a third time. Put it in the drawer. Now, take that first script out and start rewriting it because now you're a better writer. That's great advice. Isn't that amazing? I thought that was just he, brilliant. And he had the number three like me too. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or your career? Oh, that's, uh, that's pretty easy. It's uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. Oh, what a great book. Uh, it's an academic book. I was shocked when I came to Hollywood and I saw it on the bookshelves of – you know, studio executives and producers like, what is this academic book doing here? And of course, then I found out about George Lucas and star Wars, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I, I, there, you know, because of Chris Fogler's book, the writer's journey, Mm -hmm. which is an excellent book, uh, and that has, you know, the hero's journey, he reduced these 17 aspects of narrative that Campbell talked about in in the hero of the house of faces to 12 Mm -hmm. to make it more amenable for screenwriting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's become a thing. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, it makes me kind of sad in a way because I've heard producers say this. In fact, I blogged about it because I, somebody did this on a message board. A manager said, I hate the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, because it's all just this formulaic crap. Well, that's not what Joseph Campbell intended at all. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that's not what Chris Vogler intended. It's mm-hmm. what's happened. You know, people tend to reduce this thing, trying to find some sort of paradigm, you magic know, or bullet. pattern, magic bullet, you know. Right. That's not what Campbell had in mind at all. So I tend to approach the hero's journey – from more of a uh, meta view, mm-hmm. you know, the three, the three stages, uh, you know, separation, initiation, return, mm-hmm. the, the idea of transformation, that the whole point of the hero's journey is transformation and that the message of the hero's journey is follow your bliss. And so it works for me on two levels mm-hmm. as a writer mm-hmm. and storyteller and as a human being, mm-hmm. because there's, there is no more important message for a creative person, then follow your bliss. I don't oh, think. God, it's yes. Thing, it's the first thing I tell my students every quarter, and it's the last thing I tell them as we end every quarter. If you get nothing else from having worked with me in class, live with this idea. You know, you, it's it's a scary way to live. Uh, it's uh, it, it, it has ups and downs, but it is the most authentic way to live. If you if you are aligned with what turns you on creatively. And you choose to pursue that with passion and you have talent and you have a voice and you think that you've got something you can say of worth to the greater society, and the world at large, then you are set on a path that's going to bring you great satisfaction. Yes, ups and downs. Yes, trials and tribulations. You're, you're on your own high hero's journey that way. Mm-hmm. But at least you have aligned yourself with something that you know is yours. Campbell had a say, saying – a paraphrase. He said, "Nothing more. There's nothing sadder than for someone to be spend their lives climbing the ladder to success, only to discover they've been on the wrong wall." <laughs> oh wow! What an amazing quote. And that's the that's the antithesis of follow your bliss. That's what someone did not follow. Them. They followed somebody else's, not their own. Whether it be their parents or what society told them. Absolutely. Yeah. Find out what you want to do. Find out what your path. Find out what your rapture is. Your bliss. He was. That, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But he was more of a philosopher as well as an academic, and a spiritualist. Yes, uh, yes. You know, he, he created his own. You know, he taught at Sarah Lawrence University for 43 years. Mm-hmm. Sarah Lawrence College, I guess it was. Yeah. I have a picture of the doorknob for his door from Sarah Lawrence College uh, on my desk. It's, but, it's there on my desk. I uh, had someone who went to school there and found the door to his uh-huh. office that he had for a few years and uh-huh. took a picture of it. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, he created it. He didn't get a PhD. There was no PhD in what he did. He just read. People asked him, do you pray? He said, no, I, I read. He read <laughs> ten, hour, 10 hours a day. He read stories from all around the world and he noticed these similar dynamics. Separation, initiation, return. The hero gets transferred. That's, you know, yeah. He, so I wrote one again, you know. So now, that book, Hebrew with a Thousand Faces, that's the most inspirational book for me. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Hmm. 
That's a good question. I'm, I guess I'm still learning it, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, for a long time, I, I looked at my life and I thought, I've never failed. You know, I, I never even got like all the colleges and graduate schools I, I applied to. Mm-hmm. I never got rejected by any of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for the longest time, I was just living this life, you know, and then, you know, selling a spec script for, you know, a lot of money and yeah. you know, all this, right? Everything I did, music, comedy, academics, screenwriting, successful. You, you know, you learn the most about yourself, I think, in life in general when you fail. Yes. And, and that has been a lesson, you know, that I think uh, it, it's been something that I've had to learn. And uh, and you have to have that understanding to work in Hollywood because you will. You are absolutely going to fail and you're going to fail multiple times. Uh, and so you've got to be able to live with that and learn from that. So that's probably the most important lesson um, that I've you know, struggled to come to grips with. It's not fun, obviously, failing. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to determine from time to time like what lessons you can learn from it. Mm-hmm. But the one thing is universal. You just get up and you go back at it, you know, persistence. Uh, that's, you know, writer, absolutely. Uh, if you fail, just get back up and go on to the next story. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Oh, that's easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Apartment is absolutely oh. my favorite movie of all time. Brilliant. Billy Wilder is my, is my favorite. Billy Wilder and Izzy Diamond, those are my favorite uh uh, you know, Billy Wilder is my favorite filmmaker, mm-hmm. but, um, I also love the Coen brothers mm-hmm. and I also love, uh, Pixar. I'm, I'm a huge, those mm-hmm. three are, yeah, and well, Kubrick, I guess too, but yeah, of course. Oh, um, I could talk um, for hours on Kubrick. Uh, you know, I'd be tempted to put up in there cause I thought up was just brilliant. I'd be tempted to put, uh, um, there's a handful of, uh, you know, Coen Brothers movie, any of them, they're great. Uh, Inside Lewin Davis is an incredible movie, but mm-hmm. uh, but I'll go with a couple more traditional ones. Uh, Doctor Strangelove, which mm-hmm. I, it's just the, the greatest satire ever ever created, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've got to include a uh, maybe more of a okay, uh, a Silence of the Lambs. The Silence mm-hmm. of the Lambs is like the perfect uh, for what I teach. It's like the perfect movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it really is. And, and it was one of three movies to win all five of the major Academy Awards. I know it was insane. It, 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 it and it's a horror, it's a horror movie. Yeah. So, and that was, was it the, it wasn't the first to win. I think did exorcist win. No, it was the third. Um, Oh, the exorcist. I, I'm, I think it might've won something. Yeah. But, uh, it, yeah, it was, it, it, you know, I think that back then in 1991, it qualified as a horror movie. I don't know if it would necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Right. <but> yeah. <laughs> Oh, but it was it was one of the it was the third film ever to win the all five. Why? Best picture, best director, best actress, best actor, best screenplay. Wow, it was an amazing film, amazing yeah. film. Now, uh, where can people find you, sir? Uh, well, if they're in Chicago, I'm at the- <laughs> no, no, not your personal home address. <laughs> online, <laughs> online. I can tell you a bar that I hang out at. <laughs> over at Nick Park. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, no, uh, they can find me at gointothestory.com. dot com. That's mm-hmm. you know, it's actually go into the story black dot blacklist or b l c k l s t dot l s t dot com. But just go into the story, um, which is the, my blog, um, and then the screenwriting masterclass, which is my online educational resource that uh, I teach online. I've been doing it for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, had great s- success with my students. Many of them have gone on to do very very well with themselves. Um, so there's that, uh, there's the zero draft 30 Facebook group, which I host, but, mm-hmm. uh, basically that just is those people there are just great and they constantly doing stuff. So those are three, three ways you can reach me. Scott, thank you so much, man, for taking the time out. It's been a lengthy conversation, but I, and I could ask I could ask you another hundred questions, but I know you're a busy man. You've got 15 blog posts to put out today. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I do have another call right now, so it's a good time to end. So. Scott, thank you again so much, my friend. Okay, great uh, talking with you. And good luck with your uh, your blogging. And Scott really did drop some great knowledge bombs on you guys. I really hope you got a lot out of that episode. I know I did. And I want to thank Scott again for uh, doing the show and really just sharing so much great information with the tribe. So thank you, Scott, once again. Now, if you want links to anything we discussed in this episode, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS 019. 
And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com and leave us a good review. Leave us a five-star review. It really helps out the show. It's a young show. It's a new show. And every review helps us in the rankings and iTunes and helps us get this information out to other screenwriters who need it. And by the way, happy July 4th to all of our listeners here in the United States. I hope you have a good 4th. Eat a lot. Enjoy some fireworks. And as always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y dot com. 